started. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for today's grand round. Uh, we have Tam T. Van. She is a clinical assistant professor, Department of Dental Diagnostic Science, and has served as the senior as the director of the Senior Care Dental Clinic since 2007. The clinic provides patient care in an outpatient clinic and at select nursing home facilities. Uh, Dr. Tam Van completed her undergraduate dental education from Utesca in 1997. Following graduation, she completed a one-year general practice residency in Temple, Texas. Uh, her clinical experience includes four years of active duty, active duty in the U.S. Air Force here in Lackland. She was in private practice for two years and led the dental service at the Daughters of Charity Service San Antonio for three years. Special needs patient care Specifically, specifically, the medically compromised elderly is an area that she helps undergraduate dental students to appreciate in her position in the Department of Dental Diagnostic Science. Dr. Van completed her Derrick Fellowship right here at the Testa Department of Medicine and at our REC. Uh, her topic today is uh, on dental bleeding considerations, and uh, would you help me uh, in welcoming Dr. Dr. Van? Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for asking me to come talk, Mark. We're going to talk today about dental bleeding considerations before, during, and after the surgical appointment because there is, I think, a lot of um, questions sometimes that the physicians might have why the dentist consult or don't consult, or um, you know, maybe what the dentist might expect in terms of medication management for our procedure, so I'm hoping to give y'all a realistic idea of what we're able to do before the appointment, during the appointment, and after the appointment, just so, um, you know, it's not such an unknown kind of topic. But we want to talk about it today because we all see geriatric patients in this room, and they are more likely to have risk factors for prolonged bleeding, including during a dental procedure. There tends to be a stigma about oral surgery that, um, you know, that's more complicated or have more pain than it actually does or compared to medical surgery because, you know, dentistry can actually be rather pleasant. <laughs> well, that's the joke part. Okay. No, it can be pleasant. It depends on who's working on you and what you're having done, but, you know, certainly there's a lot of fear out there sometimes, um, I think because patients perceive the medical need, for example, of having their appendix out, they don't really question it, but then when they have one tooth out, it's sort of a little bit more unknown and it's not medical, it's dental, so they don't really, um, you know, they tend to be a little bit more anxious and have fear about it. And in those patients that are on blood thinners, they sometimes have a fear of bleeding to death or you know, they might have a fear that they might more likely have a heart attack in the chair because they're on blood thinners. <clears throat> and this is because I think um, when someone looks in the mirror and they see their body, they can understand it a lot better than what is inside their mouth because they might not explore the interior of their mouth. And so it's a little bit more of a foreign place for them. It's less intimate to them. They don't really know what's going on. If you tell patients sometimes, well, do you know, you know, you have this tooth or you're missing that tooth? Sometimes they don't even know because it is a, you know, like a cavity in the body, and uh, they're they're somewhat scared on their own to investigate it. And then from the dentist's point of view, you know, we can see things a bit better because um, you know we're looking directly at it. Our objectives today are going to be talking about the dental appointment, specifically like before the appointment, what are certain risk <coughs> factors for the complication that the geriatric patient might present with, how we, you know, maybe the dentist and the medical team can manage preoperatively during the dental appointment. I want to demonstrate or show you some of the things that we can do to manage so you know what kind of um, tools we have at our disposal for that. And after the dental surgery appointment, the dentists often experience complication, but then it's also not unheard of for patients, especially the elderly and especially those that are on blood thinners, they might be um, trigger happy and go to the emergency room more 
or they might end up in the physician's office. And so after the dental surgical appointment, I'm hoping to give you all some tips on how you might be able to manage a, a bleeding complication after that. And, you know, just you know what to expect from them. We want to achieve hemostasis when we're doing dental surgery because it helps us keep the operating field cleaner and clearer. We want to minimize also the blood loss. We're trying to get coagulation, we're trying to get a clot to form so that, you know, the patient can heal better. And we also want to minimize the amount of blood in the mouth because <coughs> lots of blood in the mouth could live um, as aspiration risk or the patient swallow it, they might feel nauseated. And then some patients, especially our elderly people with dysphagia problem, or even without dysphagia problem, they feel more alarmed if they feel like they have fluid in their mouth and they might have a sense that they're choking, or if they happen to start thinking about the blood in the mouth, then they might fear that they're bleeding to death. So there's a lot of advantages to trying to stop bleeding, you know, during the procedure and trying to control bleeding also during the procedure. There are a lot of causes for why a patient might be bleeding, and some of these you may see like on the floor. Um, like if you're doing your rounds. Periodontal disease, inflammation in the gums can lead to that. Trauma, you know, oftentimes a patient, like if they are <coughs> numb, or if they have neurological um, disorders of the face, they might bite themselves. People with tardive dyskinesia can do this also. Liver problems, that could affect the coagulation factors. Vitamin K deficiency. Patients that have cancer or undergoing cancer treatment may tend to bleed a little bit more. There's medications that I'm hoping to allude to today that actually can increase the risk of bleeding other than the normal ones that you um, typically associate with bleeding, which are your antiplatelets and your cuminins. Um, herbal medications can increase the chances for bleeding, blood disorders, and low platelet count can lead to more bleeding. So these patients, when we see them in the dental clinic and we know they have a known prior for this, it makes us a little bit more suspicious that this is a patient that might actually present with a bleeding complication. So before the dental surgical appointment, we're evaluating the patient for risk factors for a bleeding complication, especially if we're anticipating doing any dental procedure that's surgical or that's going to cause bleeding. Because sometimes like even a prophy, it's not necessarily surgical, but it leads to end swallows of the sulcus in the uh, gingiva, and that can lead to more bleeding than anticipated. And then we're going to work about trying to, how can we manage this preoperatively? <clears throat> the patients that will self-identify themselves as more of a potential for bleeding complications include your hemophiliac patients, your patients that are on chemotherapy, if they have idiopathic bromocytopenia, if they report that they have liver spleen or vitamin K deficiency, the patients that are on heparin or cumulin, and patients that are on aspirin, platelets, or another antiplatelet therapy. And then also less known are the patients, the um, astute you know, clinician will know that there's other medications with leading oral side effects. If we see a patient like this coming to the dental clinic and he's at, where well, this patient fell down, but if a patient presents an um, elderly, thin skin, you know, may or may not be on what we consider a blood thinner, then this might make us suspicious that this patient may possibly be more prone to uh, more bleeding during a dental surgical appointment. These are clues for us. <coughs> Preoperative management. Um, for the hemophilia patients, your von Willebrand disease patients, the vitamin K deficiency patients, uh, severe bronchocytopenia, there's these exotic things that they can do. We as general dentists don't necessarily may not choose to treat this patient depending on the procedure. If it's a very limited uh, procedure we might, but it's going to be more involved. We're more likely to refer them to the oral surgeon so maybe they can be seen in a hospital setting. And when they're in a hospital setting, you know, possibly the deficient coagulation factors or platelet might be able to be given to them, okay, as an infusion or an injection. 
So these are patients that um, you know we're a little bit more concerned with. Now, we do see the general dentist can see people that have lower platelet counts, and our guideline usually is, um, and for this particular patient, what she wanted to demonstrate for me over here was this is the back of her calf, and she has a bruise there. So it's not like a typical area that you would think someone would, you know, like bump themselves and get, you know, an ecchymosis from it. And so that's a sign that this person, you know, may have a little bit more of a risk factor. But when we see patients that have um, low platelet counts, we sort of want to ask them how often they go get monitored for it. And if they seem like they get often um, monitored and their levels are, you know, more than 60,000, then we can probably generally proceed with the dental procedure. It is simple. You know, this means like cleanings, maybe a single tooth, simple extraction, uh, fillings, those kind of things. Anything more involved, you know, we'll want to get more specific platelet levels for them. So this is our idiopathic thrombocytopenia patient here. And um, some of you may not be able to appreciate this, but some of you might have heard gums are relatively pink. They sort of look like the same color as this. So she's relatively what we consider uh, gingerly healthy, okay? Versus like someone that's inflamed and red or swollen around this area. But yet, um, and her teeth look relatively clean. So, you know, we're not that suspect, but then we find out she has idiopathic thrombocytopenia, and what that might manifest as is something like this. This is a lot more bleeding than you would anticipate for someone, um, you know, that didn't have a low platelet count. Normally, we would just clean their teeth pretty much. The scalar, which is our cleaning tool, would be above the gum line, cleaning off the calculus, and we wouldn't really anticipate having this much bleeding. I don't know, I don't know that if y'all can tell that that's a little bit more uh, excessive. You know, it's sort of running, like watery, and it's just, you know, quite a bit more than what we would uh, expect for. And that's just, you know, starting out on our cleaning procedure. But that's how they might present in the dental clinic. The other, um, there's another group of patients that we can do preoperative management for, and those are our cancer patients. Usually, you want to try to see these patients before they start their uh, chemotherapy or radiation treatment, but sometimes you can't. So when the patient is on chemotherapy, the, um, they're going to have possibly an effect on their chemopoietic cells, and that's going to lead to thrombocytopenia and um, you know a decrease in white cell count. And so it's very important that for pre-management, how we time the surgical procedures. Other times, um, they might be on other kind of therapy other than, um, I mean, or could include, you know, those angiogenesis inhibitors such as your Avastin that's been in the news, I think last six months ago, how it didn't get FDA approval for the breast cancer. But that's also another class of medication in a cancer therapy patient that would alert us to a possible chance of more bleeding. So we would go about managing those patients um, by consulting with their oncologist, figure out what their hematological status is, realize that when they are at their uh, mater, they're going to be at the highest risk for infection, and also, you know, the greatest chance of bleeding. So what, what we want to do is wait about, um, you know, a week after they reach their low point, so their cell counts and their platelet counts start rising up. The other thing about these patients is that um, we will pre-medicate them also, if, uh, and this is to help prevent um, bacterial infection of their chemical port, okay? Um, and that's not necessarily a bleeding thing, but that's just an aside for these chemotherapy patients. So, when we do a invasive procedure on this patient, we want their um, absolute neutrophil count to be over you know, 100,000 per cubic millimeter. We want their platelet counts to be ideally over 75K. We want to see their clotting factors are normal. And then, you know, anything, um, you know, any time that we think their neutrophil count is going to be lower, then we really don't want to be working up during that time. These are our, and I think, if those of you that are interested, I think Mark and Jose have this 
uh, lecture as a PDF that they can email you if you request it. Be great because yeah. I'm writing too. Yeah, I mean, but you can Thanks. get it from them, and you know, it has certain values for us that we're looking at when we're treating patients that are on chemotherapy. But usually, we wait for their NADAR, and they'll wait about a week after that. That's usually a safe time for us to do it, and usually. We're only doing like emergency type of procedures, you know, in active chemotherapy. We really um, don't want to interfere with their chemotherapy process. That means if the patient's in pain or has something that's at risk for, um, you know, causing an infection, we might try to manage those while they're having chemotherapy or, you know, something we consider relatively benign, like a Kofi, uh, which is a dental thing. We might do that, but we really don't want to get, you know, hot and heavy into our dental treatment while they're undergoing. Um, you know, cancer treatment. And again, the best time would be before, but um, because of the urgency people have when they have cancer, they're probably not going to wait for us to finish all their dental treatment before they go. But, um, you know, that would have been ideal. Okay, um, other things though that you as medical providers can help your patients do if you, you know, if they have like a cancer or at risk for cancer or other diseases, is trying to encourage them um, to go see a dentist regularly just so they can have routine care. Because if they get their uh, popo, periapical, periodontal, their coronal pathology taken care of, so that's usually like gum disease, cavities, um, root canals taken care of, you know, they're less likely to have problems in cancer or other medical problems. There's sometimes patients come in and their teeth are chipped. Those sharp edges might cause trauma to the tissue. Um, teeth that are non-restorable could be a cause for infection. Uh, partially impacted third molars that they're exposed at all to the oral environment, those might cause risk for infection. You know, try to encourage regular oral hygiene, restore the large cavities. Um, Sometimes patients wear ill-fitting dentures or partials, and they should be encouraged to maybe get them evaluated. But sometimes, if not replacing them, we might be able to repair them, and that could minimize cost for them. Our patients um, don't usually have braces, the older patients, but you know, they do. That could be sources of trauma, irritation for them. It's, you know, it's a, it's a touchy subject because these patients have so much medically going on sometimes that, you know, we don't want to make them feel any more overwhelmed by going out and getting their dental care started if they hadn't already been doing it regularly. But these kind of things, if you can encourage them, it'll hopefully will make their medical treatment, whether it's cancer or something else, a little bit, um, you know, less eventful, just so they're not distracted by something that could happen in their order. This is the coagulation pathway that um, some of us may have seen, and you know, I'm just alluding to it because later we're going to talk about some of the medications and where they go, and, and we can, you know, review that we want. The anticoagulants that we might encounter our patients beyond is, you know, they're inpatient. They might have heparin. Um, for us, that's not necessarily a concern because of the. Half life is short, and so we can usually do our procedure. Um, whereas, like the fractionated um, heparin is usually a longer half life. But again, that doesn't really worry us so much. Patients know that on Coumadin, we want to see what their INR are, and then according to what their INR is, we can use um, local measures. And we'll talk about local measure. That's a term for us. Those are the things that we can do. Um, operatively, perioperatively, to help get hemostasis during the surgical procedure. So heparin um, <coughs> could cause um, also thrombocytopenia. So us as dental providers, we have to worry about that side effect in case you know the patient needs. You know, I mean that's something that we need to have in the back of our mind just as we're preparing our patients. You know, they've been on long-term heparin. Um, but, but really, we can see a patient, like if they're coming over from the hospital um, for a reason, we can usually see them, if they're on heparin, and then they'll just go you know, back and back on. I mean, it usually doesn't affect our dental procedures too much, okay? And again, these patients that are on heparin, it's not like 
really have been going in and taking out all their teeth. These are like a very inpatient having happened. It's probably more for like the acute problems or, or something that's causing them, you know, pain. And so something like that with them being on heparin we can manage, so. There's patients that have dialysis sometimes, and uh, I mean, sometimes some patients have dialysis or on heparin, and so we have to consider that for dental surgery that we might do it a little bit, you know, longer after than immediately after. Um, other things about heparin is there's a patient on Coumadin, and we think that they're at high risk for bleeding, uh, we might refer that patient to an oral surgery if the surgery is going to be extensive because they're a little bit better at coordinating with the hospital staff by getting them like admitted as inpatient and then putting them on heparin and then doing the surgery at the time and then, you know, um, adjusting them back to their chemotherapy after. Or, you know, if we think it um, could be a, a bigger problem, we can consult with the medical doctor to maybe have fashionated heparin prescribed. We're less likely to do this because really we can manage, dentists can manage patients on Coumadin. It's not a problem. It's not something that we recommend the physician stopping the Coumadin. Uh, we would be responsible for managing the, you know, seeing what their INR level are. But these are just alternatives to consider in case um, the procedure is going to be long or, or very invasive and a lot of bleeding is anticipated. But usually this routine surgery or even getting all their teeth out with some bone surgery, we can manage it in different ways. And one of those ways is, you know, we can do the appointment um, in multiple steps. Now, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I'm going to play a couple of these videos here about taking that in-office INR. At our geriatric clinic, we have this machine because um, we do, because, you know, the, the half-life of then it's about three days. We want to get a um, we want to get you know a reading that pretty much right around the time that we're going to um, do the procedure. And, and this is just a demonstration of how we do it. There's not a lot of dental offices that have these machines because they're about like maybe a thousand dollars each. But in our practice, since we see so many people on Coumadin, um, we have it to use. Have y'all seen one of these in-office machines or sometimes the patients are prescribed and they do it at home? So y'all, you know, some of y'all may be already familiar with how to, to do it. You know, the strip close here is quite a bit bigger than a diabetic strip. You need a lot more blood than if you're taking like a finger stick with glucose. And what we're trying to do is just figure out what their INR is, and then we can modify our procedure accordingly. Like for example, um, many people have a target range of two to three, and they have AFib or DBT or past histories of, um, you know, pulmonary embolism. And then other people might have a higher target range of three point five, and they have like mechanical heart valve. Um, and it just lets us know what we can anticipate during the procedure. You know, if we're going to have a lot of bleeding or not a lot of bleeding. Their patient, if they're not like in um, compliance with their medicine, and then they're gonna, you know, it's gonna be good for us, but not good for, I mean, it's gonna be good for us from a, you know, like if they're under two, like 1.5 or something, it's gonna be good for us from a, you know, hemostatic management standpoint, though, it, you know, increases their medical risk or something, you know, for some other event. takes like about you know two minutes in the office so it's it's a handy thing for us and then you know like in this case we wait about 90 seconds and then if you don't have if the dentist doesn't have one of these machines then they're going to order it so this person's INR was a 1.2 so for what we're planning that's good though so for their um, management that's probably not the target value that we're but it's good for us, and it's good for us to know that we can proceed. But one of the main reasons we do this is not necessarily, you know, they're going to be like maybe a four, three and a half, three, two. All of that we can manage. I mainly do this so that I know the patient isn't, um, 
overly meditating and then they're not like a, a five or a six or a seven because then that would be like really bad for us and it could be really bad for them. You know, they could have more versus spontaneous bleeds and, uh, and we don't want that either. So that's really, it's not that we, we don't necessarily do it for us for managing because we we have a lot of tools that the dance can use to manage. It's just more, we don't want to be in this situation where, you know, it's dangerous for so cumulin, um, some of y'all know, affect those vitamin K vibration factors, dependent factors. I guess not just only the extrinsic pathway, but some on the intrinsic and some other proteins too. Um, if the physician's going to stop it, and that's their call, it's not our call. That then we usually, um, you know, three days is good. And then um, again. You know, if the people who don't have these machines in the office, we might um, coordinate with the physician. It's hard for us as dentists to, to uh, prescribe for labs, but we can coordinate it with the physician. They might be able to go to the human clinic within 24 hours before the appointment, get it done, and that would be good for us to know. Okay, those are the reasons, I mean, many of y'all already know that people are coming for, you know, stroke risk, embolism risk, sometimes for um, prosthetic heart valve, sometimes there's some cardiovascular indications. There's a relatively new group of medicine, these direct drop inhibitor, Pradaxa, like that one has been FDA approved for AFib, risk for stroke prevention. We don't have a lot of information on this one, but it's not going to be a problem for us. Um, we mainly going to be watching and seeing and deciding to proceed or not why the patient is on it. So we don't have a lab test to evaluate for this, but you, um, you know, it really shouldn't be a problem for us. You know, if the physician decides to discontinue it, that's their call. But we don't want, they don't need to stop it for dental bleeding because dental bleeding is relatively uh, transient and it's relative, it's really manageable. Okay, the patients that are on antiplatelet therapy, like aspirin, Plavix, those, you know, we don't take a lab value, but we take more of a, a watch and see approach. Um, patients also like an adrenaline, that's a dual platelet therapy. Now the dual platelet therapy, I will tell you, usually it's just one antiplatelet therapy, like, um, you know, it's not really that concerned for us. What I do notice with the patient on dual platelet therapy is that there is more increase but again, we can manage it, but if the patient is, like I think for example, uh, stand placement, I give the recommendations for a year, post stand, and you know, it's been, some of my patients have been on dual platelet therapy for three or more years, two or more years, and I might consult the physician just to see if maybe the physician can stop one of them. Um, why we're doing our procedure, especially we're planning a long involved procedure. And if they don't, then we'll modify our plan and do it in multiple appointments or use more local measures. But those are times that, um, you know, I might write a consult. But, it, but you know, the, it's always the physician's judgment call whether they're going to stop it or not, depending on their medical risk or other events. But we try to explain what we're doing and what our anticipated bleeding is going to be. So again, if it's a single antiplatelet therapy, there's probably not going to be modification if there's a single tooth involved. We take this watch and see approach. Um, we, the dentist, can decide on doing it multiple appointments. Sometimes we do have patients that come from far away and they might want to do it in. I mean, there's many factors that go into why we may or may not consult. And if the physician's going to stop, you, they usually decide to stop like seven to 10 days before. Now, their dual platelet therapy, this is going to have an increased effect on their uh, platelet activity. We're less, you know, we're going to delay more elective therapy probably if they're on it. Like for example, if they're doing that protocol where they're on dual platelet therapy for a year after an acute coronary event or a year after a stent placement, then we might delay elective therapy for after the dual platelet therapy. And if it's something that we can't, then, you know, we might ask them to maybe consider just putting the patient on aspirin or platics. Our expectation as dental provider is that the, um, the medical community 
do not stop the antiplatelet agent or anticoagulation agent for our dental procedure because you know we understand that y'all have to weigh draft the permanent disability for the patient against our transient bleeding. There is some evidence for those that are going to be requesting the PDF. These are some um, clinical studies they did. Uh, one of them is Cumadin and one of them is dual platelet therapy. And that shows that there is more bleeding when the patients are on it, but that the bleeding isn't um, something of a significant value that we couldn't manage. That it wasn't worth the risk of from, um, you know, medically stopping for the, the patient. And again, all of this, you know, the, 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 patient, the physician's going to know what the patient situation is they're taking it, so they can decide how much the risk it is or not based on what procedures plan. Um, there's medications that sometimes can cause bleeding that we need to be aware of and we want you to be aware of too. These are, I mean, you already know about your anticoagulants there, your antiplatelet, but hormones such as cumin, for example, can induce more bleeding. Here's an example of someone's gingiva, not necessarily gingivitis, but, you know, maybe um, they're a little bit more sensitive and more reactive to bleeding. There's some medications that cause lower platelet counts, and those include your anti-seizure medicine, some of your cardiac medicine, and some of your antibiotics, okay? Those can cause lower are not necessarily so aware of it. Maybe you physicians are more aware of it. But then when we get a little petechiae in the mouth after we do an impression or we get more bleeding when we're cleaning the teeth, you know, these are reasons why they might be because of the medicine. There's patients that are on herbal medication, and this is just a list of the ones that we know have been associated with more bleeding. Okay, so what to do with these patients with the dentist and what to do you know, from the medical side, they encourage good oral hygiene, paradox mouth rinse, I keep their mouth cleaner, healthier, try to repair the defective filling and prosthesis. This will decrease the incidence of trauma and bleeding in the mouth. And then we need to consider the causes of care, you know, uh, drug food interaction, maybe we plan the surgery phases, we might consult, we might get some lab values. And the main thing we have is local medicine. So during the dental surgical appointment, these are the things that we can do, including the local measures. You know, mainly watch and see. Sometimes we're doing all four quadrants in the mouth of extraction and bone surgery, especially in the elderly patient. Um, you know, when they get dry mouth and other medical conditions, such as arthritis, they might not be able to care for themselves as well. And so they're going to have more dental disease, and then they might, um, you know, be recommended to have maybe their teeth out, reduce their risk of infection. And so we can take a watch and see approach if, if we don't, you know, want to schedule it multiple appointments. Other local measures, you know, relatively simple. Gauze pressure, sutures, electrocautery, you know, we can zap them if they're bleeding. Sometimes there's um, arterial bleeding in the bone, and that, you know, you have an electrosurgery unit that works really well. We can zap that if not. We have to crush the bone and try and push it into the arterial area that's burning out blood. Other things we have at our disposal is um, some of this is expensive. So we tend to use a lot of um, absorbable gelatin sponges like gel foam. But you know, we might have some collar plug, which is an absorbable collagen. Surgicel, which is made by Epicon, has an absorbable cellulose that also happens to be bacterial cidal. These are things that we can have. Now, we don't, as general dentists, we don't have a lot of thrombin in our office, but someone that I guess if we would send to them because the oral surgeons probably have like thrombin guns and they can mix it with some of the other agents to help encourage more clotting. Um, there's other things that we could possibly try that's also more expensive less than we get those transitive acid or amicar as a solution to help prevent the clot being dissolved. But th so there are things we can do. So I'll show you a video here of my patient who's on dual platelet therapy. And so I, I, I'm hoping y'all can appreciate how much the dual platelet therapy caused the patient to be. It's, it's uh, hopefully going to be adequate for you to see. Here we just took out one tooth. And he had some excess bone 
here, and eventually, you know, we probably get a partial or a denture, so we had to make this incision, even though we just took out one tooth, we had to make a, um, an incision for the tooth and go further back so we could smooth out that bone, and, and hopefully the light, I don't know, can y'all see that oozing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably just ooze, and then even after we dab it, is he out? No, no, this is all local anesthetic. You know, it oozes a lot more and faster right away than um, someone that wasn't on dual plate therapy. And I mean, you know, whether that's a lot of bleeding or not, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not, but you know, in that area there, you know, somebody that wasn't on that kind of therapy, maybe we put like three stitches, and it's three sutures, and him, I think I put about 40 to make that stop. So, I mean, those are, so it's not that we can't manage it, because we can, but it's just that we have to be ready to manage it. And that's what we ended up having to do with them. We ended up putting like 40 stitches in. Um, because it just kept on losing and losing and losing. But it's something, you know, um, I think he was a post dent patient. His doctor didn't want to offer the, um, the therapy. I already discussed it, but we wouldn't have consulted because it was just one tooth, but then we ended up wanting to remove some bone because, you know, eventually he's gonna get a partial or a denture. And like, for example, this afternoon, he's coming back at 2.30, he has three teeth on the top for me to pull out, and I'll probably do one and see how it goes, and then if it goes well, then maybe I'll do another. But you can see from a, you know, like making money standpoint, that's sort of hard for us, but from a, um, you know, comfort, risk, standpoint is probably better for the patient. We'll probably just do one, I had told him. You know, so we don't want to, you know, make him feel like, um, you know, that we wanted to bleed to death. So after the dental surgical appointment, this is where the medical people might uh, have some interactions with our patient and they present with complications. So I'll talk a little bit about management of those. Here's a, uh, my patient uh, who was on, um, he has like a mechanical heart valve, so he's on Coumadin. His target value was um, 3.5, I think. We actually did his INR that day, and it was like a four. And um, you know, I could have stopped, but I think he had maybe, he only had about like five teeth down here. And um, we went ahead and did it, and, and the reason why we did it is because um, He's a phobic. He couldn't really afford IV sedation with the oral surgery department. We were giving him a significant discount to do it. And because he was such a phobic, I had blocked out three hours for him to do, to take out five teeth that normally probably, you know, would have taken me um, maybe 10 minutes to do. We blocked out three hours because we just wanted him to feel like, you know, we weren't in a rush and everything. And, and these are things that, um, you could do in the academic environment that you can do in private practice. Um, and so when we had scheduled this, you know, like months in advance, and he came in, he was all signed. So we decided to go ahead and proceed. And, and we did. And, you know, we managed it during the event. He was okay afterwards. But I don't know if you can appreciate that this is a lot of suturing. This is a lot of suturing for just that area. And then we ended up with all this uh, bruising afterwards because of the cumadon. He ended up there really well, and it wasn't like something I was particularly comfortable with, but um, with doing, but it's just like, okay, we made the appointment months ago, I blocked out three hours, I was only charging him like maybe $150 anyway, because we're in an academic environment, we could do that, but it was just wasn't, it wasn't like my proudest moment. Um, but we did it, and, he, and you know, he didn't leave, he didn't die, and it, you know, and, in the end, he had a nice set of ventures, so you know he was happy. But I probably don't want to really do that again. So we can manage it. You know, he wasn't in his target. You know, if he'd been like a three or three and a half, that would make me feel better. But he wasn't. So, but anyway, those are these are the kind of complications you can get afterwards. And when you do, when you see something like this, you know, we have to reassure the, the patient. When. Um, this is something, you know, for the medical providers and for us, because you're, the patient might come to your office instead of my office. The uh, light access and visibility is real important during the surgery and even after. Sometimes the local anesthetic can take two to eight hours after the procedure to wear away, and because of that, they're more likely to have trauma. If all their teeth were taken out, then they might bite themselves. 
That's one argument for taking out all their teeth. <laughs> oh, okay. So, no, but I mean, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, they have teeth left. They can bite themselves. So, um, you know, they get teeth biting, lip biting. And so, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell where they're bleeding from. You might have taken a tooth out on the left, and they're bleeding on the right, and you don't understand what's going on. So the best thing to do is try and clean up the area. Use your wet gauze, clean them up, have them rinse with cold water. Um, but because, you know, lots of bleeding might actually be from one side. And oftentimes, it's like probably in the cheek or on the lip. It's probably not even where we took out the, the tooth. Um, then once you identify that area, then you can put pressure in that area maybe for 30 minutes and then evaluate and then have them put more pressure. And then if you feel like you need to, you can switch in the area. Okay, so I mean, this is something that, you know, like one would not uh, think of because you would think like, okay, they're bleeding from the tooth that we pulled it, but really they're bleeding from somewhere else. Another reason why patients might not fraud is they have bad behavior. They might not be applying adequate pressure to the side. They might be doing um, bad stuff that you tell them not to do, like smoking. Um, also things that cause negative pressure, like sucking through a straw might dislodge the claw. They might be applying actually too much pressure if the gauze is dry. They might be chewing on their gauze. Um, they might be drinking hot liquids, sodas, you know, alcoholic drinks that could dislodge the clot also. So, you know, sometimes there's a reason why the clot's not staying. It could involve those reasons. On my dementia patients, um, I have found now that I use more adjunct hemostatic agent at the time of surgery. That's why they're going to end up faring a little bit better from my viewpoint. I use some gel foam or some absorbable sutures. And that's because they're really dangerous having gauze in their mouth. And that's because they might want to swallow it, eat it, you know, um, aspirate it. And so I actually would like to have them bite on gauze and have someone watch them and then after a while take it out and just leave it out and just let their care member know that they're going to lose a little bit more. But I like to do that because I can't really trust these people. You know, because they might swallow their gauze or um, or just manipulate it in such a way that their cloth comes out. So, you know, I just find out that I'm just safe with eating it out. Okay, and then the, if you get a call after hours, like if they call me and I'm not available, they might call you. Uh, really, what I try to do is reassure the patient. We tell them that after surgery, they can have losing up to 24 hours and then um, you know, if there was an infection in the area, it might actually be 72 hours. And so sometimes, like, if they're bleeding after an hour or two, they think that, you know, they're going to die. They're going to lose so much blood, they're going to die. But they're probably, uh, hopefully not going to die. Because, um, I mean, you know, it's really going to take a lot of blood for them to die. Um, anyway, wet gauze, cold water, to sort of help stop the bleeding. You want to tell them not to chew on the gauze, try not to put dry gauze. Uh, strenuous eating, that means like a lot of chewing, a lot of sharp stuff, uh, you know, nuts and stuff. That's probably not good. Sometimes it looks like more blood because it's mixed with the saliva. Some people have said, well, you know, bite on a tea bag. That's because the polyphenol in them, um, I think, helps with, uh, you know, like uh, facial constriction and helps to stop bleeding. And then we usually tell them, you know, to not go to the emergency room. I mean, sometimes they insist and they go anyway, and we just hope that they see us the next day. Um, you know, this topic, I, I wasn't, this topic came to me about because I had a rash of patients that would um, call me, and even though, despite what I told the caregiver, they were still very concerned at night, they would call me, and then the next day, uh, you know, during the night they would call, and they would keep on putting gauze in, and, and usually my, my advice is leave the gauze out. And usually in an hour it stops, and that's because more, most of the time it's because they manipulated it too much. We had a patient on chemo then, and their target was like, uh, or you know, their INR was like two, but then three days later they disrupted the clot. Who knows what their INR was then? But then they would go to the emergency room. Okay, other things uh, we need to be mindful of is these patients that are on herbals, NSAIDs, the aspirin. They might. So they don't have other risk factors, but they're on these medicines. We just need to be knowledgeable of that because these are things that, you 
you know, they tend to have a little bit more of a prolonged bleed. Um, you know, these could be the reasons. And then we have to be cognizant of special patients that are acute and things that we prescribe that might also make them take bleed more. Because given them, you know, it's sort of a messy drug. It interacts with a lot of different drugs, and many of them are severe. We as dentists prescribe antifungal antibiotics and pain medicine that can affect that. So, you know, we're doing procedures. So y'all probably prescribe medicine that don't need to be with that could, you know, also increase their risk for bleeding. So to conclude, you know, these geriatric patients are more at risk for uh, systemic conditions, and some of these systemic conditions have dental bleeding considerations. They're more likely to be on medications or herbal therapies that increase the risk for inadequate coagulation. And we want to discuss, we want to have rapport with our um, medical community to see if medical modification is appropriate for wound healing or coagulation. Uh, we totally respect, you know, what the medical provider ultimately decides because they know the clinical situation of the patient better than we do and what their risks are for, you know, other adverse event if they're not on those medications. And then, unless it's really like an acquired blood dysgrasia, such as hemophilia, von Willebrand's um, disease, some, you know, absorption problem with vitamin K, the risk of dental bleeding for a general dentist, what we can manage, I mean, the bleeding risk is gonna be really low. I mean, we can really probably manage the bleeding. We might have to alter our procedure and using more, like for example, more sutures than what we had intended or scheduling more appointments than what we would have liked or what the patient would have liked, but we can manage it. It's not, you know, we rather not put the patient through the risk of an um, adverse medical event for our convenience. Okay, so that, that's the end message is that the medical risk of stopping these anticoagulants or anticoagulant therapy is higher than the risk that we would get with the transit bleeding for most of our dental uh, surgeries. Do you want to have any questions about any of that? Or? Or, I mean, I don't know if y'all, if this is new or not new, but, you know, there, I, I hope it was a helpful topic because I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, misunderstanding about what, what our surgeries involve. And it's not really that. I mean, you know, going to the dentist is really, you know, pleasant. I encourage everyone to go and <laughs> <laughs> we're friendly and nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for joining us for today's grand round. Be sure to sign in. Uh, you will receive credit. And you'll be getting an evaluation later on today from me to evaluate Dr. Van for today's presentation. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, for you like this? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, I don't know.